Now that's just good advice. Afternoon guys. Okay, today we're going to sit and do a little whittling, a little talking and answering some questions. Uh, as to the sign, that's at my favorite lake I go to. And uh, had a friend of mine that sent me a picture of where he found a uh, alligator back last, well this year, early this year. When all that cold weather came into Texas and all, he found an alligator frozen in the water with his head just sticking up like his nose. And he thought he was dead. Alligators don't die from that. The water is actually warmer than the air at that point. And alligators will sit there and go into a very uh, dormant state. Think of it as a very deep sleep. And they'll just poke their nose up. They'll get into a hollow bank if they can or up under some sort of stuff and they'll just put their head up and they'll go to sleep. He ain't dead. So if you ever come across ice with a nose sticking up and you think, oh, poor thing died. He ain't dead. Don't mess with him. That's just one of them things where if it looks that, that easy, it ain't that easy. So, now we got that out of the way. Here we are. Christmas has passed. And old man winter is right around the corner. And for some of you in some parts of the country, you're about to get some really cold air. Remember this past, well, this year, this past spring and all and winter, we had Texas froze from all the temperature drops and etc. So it would pay right now to do a little bit of uh, preemptive sticking things away. So my advice is, if you've got a house that's all electric, that's all it does is electric, find another heat source as a addendum. Um, a buddy heater or something like that that can hook to a propane tank, get a few of the big barbecue propane tanks and get the adapter hose that hooks to it, and uh, use it sparingly, just when you got to have it because the power may be out for a couple of days in certain storms like that. And it depends on where you're at, you know, how your environment is set up to it. Here in my south, we're not set up for such uh, conditions, and our trees are really more conditioned for severe storms than they are ice storms. And so whenever we have ice storms, it's massive power outs because so many trees are so close the power lines they just start falling and snapping we don't have snow and ice now up in the other parts of the country where they do have snow and ice your trees are kind of conditioned to that and the limbs snap off etc on the other hand you're not conditioned to high winds and so whenever you have a real hard blowing heavy storm where it's 60 70 mile an hour wind your trees go down because a the ground is glacial silt and B, your trees are not got a root ball to hold them in the ground in hurricanes like ours do. A lot of our pine trees will have a tap root that goes down 30 feet, holding that tree up in a you know hurricane type stuff because it, it has to handle our heavy storms. So it's just where you're at is what you're going to have to face. But back to on the winter section, what you want to do is figure out what your needs are going to be in the worst case scenario. If you've got a house that's all electric, have you a water source, some water to put up? Have you a way to heat your own food? Uh, a simple transgia and alcohol works fine with standard cooking pots. Uh, a barbecue grill works good, but not inside. Now you apartment dwellers, you've got it even harder. You've got to get up next to a window or something where you can get a little ventilation, and that's why I really recommend the little alcohol burners like a transgia because those will give off very little fume, so to speak. Don't use it as a heat source. Use it as something to heat your food up with. You could put like a brick or a pizza stone down or something onto a, a table, put it in the center of the top of it, and use it. That stays cool enough at the base it's not going to start a fire. And take the time to go watch some YouTube videos about making and using such stoves to educate yourself. Don't be the one time you, you bought it, and I've never even tried it, and now it's the only source I got to heat food, you know. As well as make sure you got plenty of flashlights, candles, whatever for lighting. Because if you have the power outage, you're not going to have the heat. Do you have enough blankets? Um, I have 
family and friends that live down in Florida, and they live at a place where they don't even have a, a heat pump. Their houses have air conditioning. They don't have a heater because they're below Orlando. So when you do actually get cold down there, they don't have any way to heat the house. Well, better have a good supply of blankets to be able to get in bed and pile up and stay warm. So clothing, blankets, or a heat source, those are your options. And so make sure that you're prepared in your area for what you're going to face. Now, sticking to the winter thing, I've had several people ask me about I camp in a hammock in winter. And my rig, which I've showed several times, is a one wind hammock rig. And it's how do you, you know, are you warm? Does your back get cold, etc.? <coughs> Here is my work ethic, we will call it, when I'm facing this. What are the expected temperatures going to be? Let's say they're going to be 30 degrees. Plan on at least 10 degrees colder. Okay? Have a cushion. So I'm carrying what I think I'd need down in the 20s, just to be sure. I prefer to wear a base layer of something that's kind of nylon or slicky. It gives you more mobility because then when I put the uh, long underwear, the insulating layer on top of it, the two layers will slide. And so I know the ladies can't understand this, but guys with hairy legs, you'll understand this. You pull on them long underwear, them long johns or whatever, or you pull on that long shirt, and uh, it's okay for a while, but after a while, your chest hair, your legs hair, everything kind of gets all, uh, and it itches like crazy. <laughs> and you're laying there at night trying to, you know, stay warm, and the top of your thigh is just itching like fire ants from all the hair has now got leaned every which way, and it doesn't like it. And it's something you're not accustomed to or used to. So I found that putting on a slicky, you know, like silk layer on first helps with that greatly and also it helps with my mobility as I'm walking because the heavier insulating layers will slide on it and it doesn't seem to bind me up or cramp me up as much. This also applies when I'm going to bed. When I'm about to go to bed I'm going to make sure that's when I change my socks and underwear definitely. Any t-shirt I've had against my skin needs to be changed. It's cotton. Get rid of it because you cannot help but secrete up to a quart of water through your skin every day, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing nothing but sitting there and breathing. And because of that, you're going to end up dampening that. And damp cotton is just a wick. All it's going to do is suck all your heat, and you're never going to feel like you're warm. And so even if you are warm, so to speak, that uh, damp cotton is just going to make you feel like you're soaking wet and you're going to burn a whole lot more calories the body trying to generate heat and you're also going to feel colder so you want to get rid of that so I want bone dry against me when I'm going to lay down fresh socks on definitely the socks that I wore during the day I may take and put underneath me up here at my chest under my blanket or whatever sometimes I'll hang it in between my underquilt and my hammock and let my body heat kind of dry it out during the night and tomorrow I'll swap back to those socks because it'll kind of dry it out but I don't want to sleep in them okay next after I have got the insulating layers I'm gonna wear proper outer clothing that's movable don't have anything tight and binding you want loose clothing in winter kind of baggy because it traps warm pockets of air something that's tied up against you Heat just goes through it and goes out in the environment. You lost it. But if it's loose fitting, you're trapping pockets of warm air around your body. And that makes you feel warmer. Okay? And then there'll often be an outer layer that's non-permeable. In really cold conditions, I have a um, Adirondack rain jacket that has a hood. And I have a pair of rain pants that I'll put on pull on over my long underwear. A, it's slicky. It's a nylon, so it slicks and slides inside my hammock and inside my sleeping bag and etc. Again, so I'm not binding up. When you go to lift your leg up, or I had to move for the, keep the light even, 
um, the long underwear and stuff, if it doesn't move well when you lift and bend your legs and wants to bind up, and then you add a sleeping bag or whatever that wants to bind up on whatever your outer clothing is that you're wearing to bed, it's just a mess. Every time you pull your leg, the, everything comes up. You can't just move your leg up. Now the whole sleeping bag moves up, and you, you, you tangled up, and it's just, it's a constant frustration. So my outer layer uh, will be something kind of slicky as well when I'm going to bed to be able to give me the maximum amount of uh, fluid movement while I'm in the sleeping bag. I want to shift around and move around to whatever position I need to go and not be kind of stuck to the bag. You understand what I'm saying? Flannel lined bags are great and warm, but you better have something slick on because if you're wearing flannel uh, long handles and you are flannel type material and that flannel, the flannel, the flannel sticks like Velcro and you just can't seem to move anything. It just wraps around your leg. It's a constant fight. I've been there, done that. Don't waste your time. So I've got an outer layer that's kind of slick as well. Now, on top of me will be a very adequate uh, sleeping bag layer. Uh, in the extreme cold, if we're going to go down into the 20 or below into the teens, it's going to be my MS sleep system sleeping bag is what I'm going to have on me. Much better. Have to shift around the sun gets blaring on me and it just reflects back at the camera and I can't see anything in the camera lens. But technical difficulties. Now for the sleeping bag, I want a good heavy sleeping bag. Uh, I like something like a, uh, not truly a mummy style, but something like a MS sleep system. Something that's going to wrap around me but isn't square. I'm going to zip it halfway up. Okay. And where usually you have a sleeping bag laying and you lift it up and you slide into it, right? I'm going to take it and I'm going to drape it over my ridge line. I'm going to get into the hammock. I'm going to reach up and I'm going to grab the sleeping bag. I'm going to pull it down into the sleeping bag. I'm going to pull one leg up and I'm going to put my foot into that half zipped up bottom part and push down and straighten out my leg. Then I'll take the other leg and put into it. Then I fold the sleeping bag back over me. So I'm now completely in the bag. I roll up this way and I tuck it under that side. And I roll up and I tuck it under that side. And I take the top of it and I tuck it under my head on either side or just go over my face if it's really cold. And that's how I run a top quilt out of a large sleeping bag. Now that, for me, has done the best. One, are you wearing some sort of head? Uh, always wear a baklava, toboggan, or pull the sleeping bag up over your head because you lose so much of your body heat through your head. Um, the brain's got to be kept warm, guys. That's all there is to it. And so the body has X amount of calories it can waste to create body heat. And you don't want to burn them up. A lot of people talk about when they lay down, they're near about ready to sweat, and two hours later they wake up freezing to death. Usually that, that means that they're not regulating well, and they're, they're, they're losing the heat somewhere. Okay. Before I go to bed, is about an hour before I go to bed is when I'm going to eat my big heavy meal. So I have filled up my stomach. I have created digestive heat because my stomach's sitting there churning and the body's processing. So that's coming up. So about the time I get in bed, I've gone to the bathroom and everything, I'm good for the night. Now I get into my sleeping bag, I'm radiating heat. So I'm warming up my sleeping bag. I'm warming up my hammock. Okay. I pull it up here over me. A lot of times I'll just pull it up to here, you know, put my arms up on top. Because I'll be a little too warm, honestly, when I first get in. After I, you know. And then... I'm warming up the sleeping bag. I'm warming up everything. Then when I get cool, I'll pull my arms in. Okay. Then I'll pull the sleeping bag up over my head, but I'll leave an air hole right here on the side so I can breathe. Or I'll, whichever way I got to shift. Okay. So that takes care of my top layer and my personal layer. Now in the hammock itself, I don't put a pad inside. I have slept with a pad inside a hammock and one wind does make a double bottom hammock for putting a pad in if that's where you want to go. Some people really like it. I, it was always a, always a frustration to me. 
because I move around so much. And whenever I put a, a pad underneath me, it always ended up getting wadded up and you know, it's jobbing you in your ribs because it's bowed right there and it wants to buck up because you're laying on it and it wants to curve. And it was always just a pain. Um, I much prefer an underquilt. Much, 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 because it just wraps around me. <clears throat> so immediately below my hammock is my underquilt. One wind makes what's called a blanket, which is actually like an underquilt liner. It doubles the thickness of the underquilt and it snaps in. So I'm carrying those two. And that will cup up around me to trap the heat. So as I'm laying in the hammock and my body heat is radiating heat through the material of the actual hammock itself, that underquilt material is capturing that heat and holding it and holding it back up against me instead of letting it just flow away from me. Okay? So I've got the underquilt blanket and then the underquilt itself hanging underneath me. I want a little more. Well, One Wind makes, and other companies made too, a rain cover, which is a piece of material that's windproof and waterproof and it goes over the outside of the underquilt. Well that acts like another layer and now it's trapping air so this breeze is coming it's not actually going through the underquilt it's being a windbreak and stopping the air from going into the underquilt and robbing me of my my BTUs that I've worked so hard to create I want to keep them. So I put that on the outside of that. If I need to go warmer still they make a thing that's called a uh, uh, the winter cover and it goes over the whole hammock like the mosquito net does and it's got two air pockets up here and it's got a cinch up door in the bottom of it so you would get into your hammock reach over pull that up cinch the door close since you're laying in the hammock you're up in the air column right you're generating body heat and like it or not, it's got to rise up. It's got to float up. So the air beneath you is being warmed by contact from your body, and then it's flowing by you like this, out and around the hammock and up, and going away from it. So it's a constant pull. That's the reason when you're laying there in a hammock, you feel cold on your back. You don't feel cold like that in other places. It's because of the airs robbing that those BTUs from that area and the airflow is actually flowing around. If it was like smoke, you'd see it just do like that and go around your body and go up. Well, by putting this cover over the whole hammock, it replaces the mosquito net and you cinching it closing the bottom, you stop that air draft because there's no fresh air coming in the bottom to flow up and it's, it greatly cuts down that radiant heat, that conveying heat going away from you. It just stops, well, it don't really stop, but it greatly, greatly reduces it and brings up your heat. Up here on the top, there's two mesh panels for your breath to go out so it doesn't condensate in there and you got plenty of air. I have done that. What I have also done, lacking putting that on, and I've um, camped several times now with it in the winter. Um, I've had my, the rig, like I've explained, with my underquilt. But rather than putting that full cover on, what I've done is simply just put my tarp over my ridge line and then not staked it out, just let it drape loose around the outside of my body. So I've got an air hole at the top and an air hole at the bottom, but the tarp is hanging down on the side of the hammock and going down. Well, this is a windbreak. So any wind coming from the sides, the tarp catches it and guides it away from my body that limits that heat coming up. The fact that it's going to be hanging against the side of the hammock all the way around kind of breaks that convection current coming up as well and forces it to come up and it also has just a little airflow across the top so you don't feel claustrophobic in there. You've got air. So that's what I've done. I did it uh, the fuel of the fire gathering in North Georgia back in February where it was down uh, I think 28 that night. I did that. Um, when we went to Georgia Bushcraft and it was in the low 30s up there, if not, one person said 28, but I, I don't know. But uh, I had several people say it was in the low 30s. And that's how I camped with just my tarp draped on either side of me and my underquilt and et cetera as I did. And I was perfectly fine. I never felt cold at all. You know, that, oh, I woke up cool, but I, no. 
Um, I was as warm as I was in a bed at home. So it can be done. Now, looking at other guys' channels, Suge Emery, up there in Minnesota, he's going out in negative 40 below in hammock camping. Well, with the proper gear, the proper acclimation, and proper procedure of knowing that me eat, get my core temperature up, and setting the stage up, yeah, you can. Um, I understand from a subscriber of mine, he is a Marine in Norway, and they use hammocks. And he says they've gone out in 30, 40 below before with hammocks because they carry the gear to get them off the ground, insulate them, etc. And it's just quicker than digging a snow cave to hang between two trees because you're in a fairly sheltered area to get out of the wind and you're up off the snow and they're properly insulated and properly prepared for it. So it can be done. Um, but it is a learning curve. It's something you're going to have to practice. You're going to have to figure out how to, to apply it. Um, and I know how this sounds. You're talking to a guy that lives in the deep south. And uh, as my good friend Dan Lutt said, if you want to learn about how to be warm in the cold weather, go down and talk to them southern boys. Yeah, because we're not used to it, so we go out of our way to find a way to be warm down here. It's the same thing of the things that they did up there to try to stay cool in the summer were different than what we did down here. You know, it's, it's the region you're at and what kind of environment you're at is going to make a big difference. So, now, um, another young man had asked me about how does my gear change in the winter? Uh, my haversack and all remains the same, and that's a, a core base that I've worked out, and we've already talked about that many times. The big difference is I go from a rucksack to a true backpack. I've got a 45 liter, or maybe it's a 65 liter backpack. Winter clothing, winter gear is very bulky. It's not that heavy, but it's very bulky. It's any of you that know about a MS sleep system, it's about this big around and about that long. I mean, fully all of it. But uh, you can get gear that is small and light, usually very expensive, that can get you that kind of temperature. But bulk is your friend, usually in the cold temperatures, because you need to trap as much area, as much warmth as you can. So when I transition over to a, we're going out in, you know, January and doing a camp out, so to speak, I'll be toting that bigger backpack because it will have the long underwear, the extra socks, the extra food because you're going to need to keep that core temperature running, the uh, underquilts, the bigger sleeping bag, etc. The head covering, you know, I wear my hat every day. But at night when I go to bed, I'm not going to sleep with this hat. I'm going to take it off and I pull on a baklava, a big thick baklava. Uh, that just lets my eyes shine out to try to trap as much heat as I can on my face and my body. And um, it, it amazes me. I have friends that are basically bald. And they'll be out there and it'll be, you know, 15, 16 degrees. And they're laying on the ground and you see their head sticking out, you know, like this of a sleeping bag. It's like, I know you got to be cold <laughs> because that head radiates so much heat and the body is going to warm that head. So you, it's just far better to put an insulating layer on the head. Um, let's see, was there another thing that... Oh yeah, Miss Carol uh, contacted me and she asked for me to explain about water in the winter. Uh, do you carry more water or not? Do you just rely on the sources, etc.? Down here in my part of the south, we don't have to worry about ice. It, there are ice storms. We do get cold enough to freeze. But it's so short-lived, we don't have to worry about like a lake freezing over or anything like that. I've uh, Even a body of water this big would never freeze 
uh, even in our coldest outbreaks, you might have a little in little pockets around the edge, but it would never get cold enough. So we we can get water down here. Um, even the water sources uh, will keep flowing down here. I uh, there's a geologist, I believe it is, that uh, made the statement several years ago that Alabama was the Amazon of America because if you look at a map all the streams, rivers, creeks and stuff in Alabama it's just a spider web. We have water everywhere down here and I realize that many of you in different parts of the country don't have that option. But down here literally you cannot walk more than a mile and you're going to find a water source of some form. And if you don't like that water source, walk another half mile and you'll find two more. So you never hear about anybody saying they couldn't find water for the canteen. If you use a filter or something like that, there's plenty of water down here. And in the winter, you definitely need more water. You actually need more water in the Arctic than you do in the desert. And a buddy of mine was a Marine Corps Arctic instructor. And he's told me several times about that, about how guys would not understand that that's one of the main ways that your body stays warm. You have to stay hydrated. And so if you're not drinking water, you're going to be cold. You need to keep your core water up. You need to make sure you're having to go urinate every couple of hours. Because if you're not, you're not processing enough. You don't have enough fluid. Um, in the military training, they said you needed to have to go urinate at least once every two hours. If not, you're not drinking enough. Keep drinking. You're surrounded by snow up there, so there's plenty of water. We ain't going to run out of water. But what we are going to run out of is you're going to dehydrate, and when you dehydrate, you get cold in a hurry. That's one of the major ways that the body keeps flowing heat around the body is through water. So make sure you stay extremely hydrated. That's a big factor. Now, of course, me down here, I prefer hot chocolate. I'm not a big fan of drinking coffee that much. And I know that sacrilege, Mark Hudson, I'm looking at you, brother. But uh, my dad was somebody who could drink five pots a day. And it was always around me, and I just never got a taste for it. I'll drink a cup of coffee every so often, but I would rather drink hot tea or hot chocolate, five to one of coffee, plus the fact that it's going to keep me awake at night. And um, I want to be, when it's time to go to bed, I want to be able to lay down and go to bed. I'll get up you know, when it's time to get up. But I know guys, they'll just sit there and they're just chugging that coffee, big mugs of coffee. And um, then they're waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning. They can't go back to sleep. The fire's dead out. It's howling wind. It's cold and bitter. And what you going to do but lay there? Um, I prefer to, you know, drink something. And, and here's something that a lot of people don't get, okay? When you read a lot of the early scout books and stuff like that, a lot of times they didn't give you just uh, cocoa or hot tea or whatever. They give you soup. So on a cold winter's night, how about pouring yourself up a mug of tomato soup or potato soup or chicken noodle soup, chicken broth, something thick and rich because that's also giving you fuel. See? So it's warm, it's liquid, it's warming you, and it's giving you fuel. Well, guys, I've probably babbled a little enough. I want to say thank you very much for everything you've done for me in 2021. And hopefully 2022 will be better for all of us. Till next time, guys, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.